greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Ship Project. The Pedal Ship Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 089, and you can email me at the show, pedalshift at pedalshift.net, or call the voicemail hotline at 202-930-1109, and Pedalshift is also on all the socials too. Hello and happy August to everybody if you're listening to this in real time. If you're not, happy whatever month you happen to be in. Hello to the future. Um, this is the 89th edition of the Pedal Shift Project. My name is Tim Mooney. As always, your humble host. Thanks for joining the show again. And if it's your first time, welcome. Very happy to have you here. It's all about bicycle touring here at the Pedal Shift Project, the cool podcast with a made-up name about bicycle touring. Um, so... 89 episodes. I graduated high school in 1989. Again, totally dating myself. Firmly Gen X. Hi. Um, it's kind of exciting. Uh, once a Raider, always a Raider for all you Fairport High School graduates. I think that's a small slice of the listener demo. Um, hello. And on this episode, not only are we welcoming August 2017 uh, as of the recording of this, but uh, we're going to be doing um, a, a whole bunch of cool things this month. I've got some uh, uh, interviews lined up with some people who are friends of the show and listeners and whatnot talking about the tours that they've had this summer. And I'm, I'm hoping to get those to you here in August, if not September, uh, just getting those things lined up. In the interim, of course, we've got all sorts of great things to talk about. Um, I'm going to be going on a tour probably not until... I'm going to say October. I think that I might have some other small rides planned, but I got a bunch of things, a bunch of uh, irons in the fire. I think that's the that's the idiom that I want to use and uh, things going on. So I'm not going to be able to get out for a multi-day, but I am hoping for a longer tour, perhaps my longest tour of the year coming up this fall. We'll have much more about that in a future episode of the pod. But on this episode, it is a mini-sode, it is a topic episode that I have been putting out all this year. This episode, we're going to be talking about purifying water. Tim, you may ask, if you're a longtime listener or a binge listener of the show, didn't you not cover this in episode 23 of the Pedal Ship Project? To which I say, you are a giant nerd, how do you know that, other than you've looked at the show notes? Um or you've recently listened to it. Maybe I should not call you a nerd. Um, yes, I have covered this topic previously, but a few things have happened in the interim. Number one, friend of the show, Brian Wren, has written in uh, about a million years ago to suggest uh, some additional things to talk about in that. And plus, a few things have, have come to my attention in the realm of purifying water, including my use and my change of water purification systems. So uh, I thought I would bring it up again. This is an important topic. Now, last episode, episode 88, if you haven't listened to it, also minus one from 89 is 88 math. It's a math podcast episode of this, the, uh, the the Pedal Shift Project. Um, on episode 88, we talked about heat and tips for riding in the heat. I think that this is an incredibly important piece. Water is always necessary no matter what time of year you're riding. But if you are riding during the hot months – the hot months, you need more water, as evidenced by episode 88 of the Pedal Ship Project. Um, you just need to. So sometimes you're going to be in a place where you need more water and you've got a questionable supply of water in front of you. It may be something as nice as a clear looking mountain stream that's kind of running nicely by you, in which case, you know, the odds of you dipping in there and being able to pull out water that will not make you sick is, you know, slightly higher than the stagnant, nasty, mosquito mosquito algified pond that is uh, around the corner. But I'm here to tell you, it's not always that simple. I mean, um, the types of critters, technical term, that can hide in water that is untreated can really make you sick. We're talking things like Giardia. We're talking about Cryptosporidium. We're talking about all types of things that can really not only put a kibosh on the rest of your tour, but it could have some really serious deleterious effects to uh, your overall health and well-being, especially if you've already got a compromised immune system or things along those lines. Uh, you know, you got to be careful about your water. You want it to be more than just potable. You want it to be well, straight up safe. I think that that's the same thing, actually but follow me. Um, so I'm going to run down a few of the things that 
I have experimented with and some suggestions from Brian and some other folks as well. I'm curious if you've got some alternative ideas or if you have tried any of these things and have plus or minuses uh, on any of them, because I think it's really important to share this with the community. I, I think I've got a preferred method now. Um, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, but um, there's there's all sorts of different methods out there, and so I thought that this is, well, not maybe comprehensive, it'll at least give you an idea of what's the universe for treating water when you're out there. And for folks who are sort of like, yo, I don't camp, I I, I don't worry about, you know, things like that, I'd, I'd recommend that you, you make sure you pay attention to this one, even if you are going to be hopping from uh, bed and breakfast to hotels to warm showers or whatever, I would always recommend that you have some kind of a water treatment strategy if you're going to be in any place where you're going to be going even more like, you know, 10 or more miles away from a water source. And frankly, that's going to be most of the rides that you're going to be on. It's not that you can't plan ahead for it and have lots of water, but you never know what can happen. I'll give you one example. I've gone riding before and thought that I had more water on me than I actually did. And in a couple of instances that I can remember, I actually had a water bladder uh, that the top of it uh, leaked and I had it in the, uh, I, I don't want to say it was the rear pannier, it was sort of on top of my rack sack on the back and it was facing down. And as I was riding, it just leaked the whole thing out. Now that was going to be my sort of uh, extra water bottle, as I've talked about before. And if you're kind of banking on your emergency supply being there and it's not, surprise, you never know what can happen. Um, you may lose it. It may shake out. There are all sorts of good reasons to be prepared that you may have to treat some water when you're on the fly. Um, many of you are touring in areas where you're always going to have access to water. I still think it's worth uh, having this skill set in your pocket just in case. So uh, purifying water. The method that I have grown to really like, or the tool is probably the better way of putting it, is a product by Sawyer. It's called the Sawyer Squeeze. I've got a link in the show notes to that. It is really light. It is really cheap, and it is really simple to use. It's just a small cylindrical filter that attaches to a water bottle on one side and a squeeze bag on the other, uh, or another water bottle. just depends. It's very, very uh, multimodal. You can attach all sorts of things to it. They have different attachments for different types of hydration packs, all types of things out there. It's really well thought out, really well engineered, and really well designed, and did I mention that they're inexpensive as well? So the cool thing about them is that you have basically a dirty container and you have a clean container and you take from the dirty and you can use a gravity fed method. You can use a squeeze method. You can use, uh, they even have like a kind of a syringe like thing. There's all sorts of different ways, all different ways that you can do it. However, makes sense for you. And I encourage you to uh, take a look online for all the different ways to use it. Um, believe it or not, I've never really had to use mine in any state of need, but I have it just in case. It filters out the vast majority of the different types of toxins and critters, again, technical term, that would make you sick. It's a really helpful thing to carry, and it's the thing that I end up recommending the most just because I think that it does the most for the cheapest amount and also gives you a pretty nice tasting product on the other end of it. Some of the things that I've worked with in the past as well, and it's sort of the old school way of doing it, are iodine tablets. Um, the reason why I deal with iodine a lot is because not only have I used iodine tablets before, way, way back in the day, I'm, we're going back to, oh, I don't know, 1989-ish when I was doing a lot of camping and you know backpacking as a, uh, a, a teenager in the wilds of Western New York. Um, I, I would bring those along to purify water when I was out. And um, it tastes terrible. And I talked about this, I believe, back on episode uh, 023, that you can crush up vitamin C tablets and kind of mix it all in, and it will precipitate out or otherwise absorb some of the iodine flavor. It works okay, um, but it's not the best thing in the world. It's not the greatest technique. But I'll tell you what, these are the types of things that are going to be available at kind of a Walmart. Or if you don't have a lot of access to camping stores or you don't have time to wait for an Amazon delivery or if you're in Europe, whatever other types of delivery services that you might have available if Amazon's not available to you. 
Um, it's, it, it's the type of thing that you'll be able to find at camping stores and outdoor stores pretty easily, very inexpensive, and frankly, st- st- stood the, the test of time. What it won't do is it won't take out particulates. It won't help you with flavor. Talked about the vitamin C trick. Eh, it works. It's not great. Um, but cheap, easy, and light, iodine tabs. Uh, Brian Wren, friend of the show, and I believe, is, is Brian a member of the Pedal Shift Society? Of course, Brian is a longtime member of the Pedal Shift Society. He's middle of the list kind of guy, which means he's been around for a while. Thank you, Brian, for supporting the show through that. Uh, but also for uh, sending in a uh, hat tip to him for talking about Oasis tabs. He recommended those, and sorry, apologies, Brian, I feel like you sent this maybe a year ago. It could be that long. Um, really on top of the topics here on the Pedal Shift Project. Uh, Oasis tabs. They're... Uh, akin to iodine tablets, but I believe don't have the taste issue. Brian recommends them and uses them uh, better than iodine if they're available to you. They're a specific brand available out there. Um, Higher tech options that are available as well. Um, I've never used these and I'd be really curious. I believe that some other people have written into the show and have tried these out. They'll help you for killing critters, but they will not help you for filtering out particulates or dealing with taste. Those are the ultraviolet pens that you will see out there. Um, They're battery operated. They uh, apparently work quite well. They're very, very efficient at killing bugs. Again, technical term. They are not actually bugs in the water. Uh, so I, I never use them. They are apparently quite effective. So it will take care of things. It's nice for handling things and disposing of, uh, bacteria and other types of microorganisms that could potentially get through a filter. Now, most filters, such as the Sawyer and some of the other ones that are on the market, they get just about everything. Um, they are, you know, ninety nine point eight percent effective. Um, you could make an argument that these UV pens, when used effectively, and of course that's the rub, would get and zap the ones that might get through. But I think efficacy is really hard to measure because nobody is ever perfect. I mean, when you follow instructions to the the hilt, of course, you're going to get everything and it's going to operate uh, in a good way. But um, I'd say the UV pens probably are in the same ballpark in terms of efficacy. Interesting stuff. Never used it. I tend to prefer the sort of old school style of the uh, the filters and the Sawyer uh, as my tool of choice right now. But some of you might have uh, tried the pens. I'm curious what you think. I know a lot of people who are in real backcountry uh, will use these sometimes in addition to um, the Sawyers or other similar filters. Curious what you think. They're obviously smaller. They're battery powered, however. So you've got to deal with the fact that you're either going to have to recharge them, replenish the batteries, or any of a variety of things. They may not be good for a really long-term expedition style unless they do work for you. So curious what you all think. I've never used them, but I know they exist. Next up, low tech. Um, a low tech solution to purifying water is not purifying water at all. <laughs> um, this is carrying water from trusted sources. And, you know, that's sort of, I, I use the term, uh, the phrase file under duh a lot. Um, this is kind of Well, this is probably at the front of that file. Uh, if you're worried about running out of water, carry more water. And carry it from someplace where you have a trusted source. Uh, Again, this works only insofar as A, your carrying capacity, and B, making sure that what you're carrying it in doesn't fail on you. I already talked about the situation where I've had water bladders that will suddenly start to leak or um, other instances that I've had. I'm sure some of you have had this too, where you've got water bottles that you think are secure and they're either in a cage or they're bungeed tightly and nicely to the outside of something or they're in a pocket of some uh, coat or or, or conveyance that you have, some some piece of, of clothing, and uh, next thing you know, you turn around and they're gone because they've fallen out. Have had that happen to me before as well. So low-tech, carrying water from trusted sources, that works, but there's lots of fail points there as well. So know what your capacity is. I've been watching a lot of videos, I think I've been talking about last few episodes of the pod, about people who are carrying water um, vis-a-vis uh, their long-distance hiking uh, I talked about uh, homemade waterlust, her uh, Dixie, who's uh, doing the PCT, the Pacific Crest Trail, 
And she was just going in a series of videos going through the Mojave Desert section. And there was one area where I was I believe it was somewhere between 80 or 90 miles where there were no water sources. So she's carrying liters and liters and liters of water on her back. Um, now, that's great. She had to. I mean, that's the scenario. But, you know, what would have happened if... God forbid, you know, she had tripped or something like that. And or in our case, if we're on a bike and we take a tumble and maybe it falls on one of our water bottles and it kind of explodes out and we lose an entire liter of water. How would you be able to handle that? Um, that's one of the reasons why I suggest maybe having some purification system along with you, regardless of the type of ride that you're on, might be the difference between going thirsty or worse, getting into some dehydration zones because Carrying water from trusted sources only goes so far, your carrying capacity or your ability to keep it within that water bottle or bladder. Um, I've talked about emergency bottles before, and I think I, I think episode 23 might have been the first time that I talked about this, but I think that this is a critical piece of your sort of fail-safe redundancy emergency kit kind of things. I always make sure that I have a bottle or bladder that is not what I'm intending to drink or work from uh, during the ride at any point at all. Sometimes I'll use it in camp uh, at the end of a day, especially if I end up at a camp that doesn't have water. It gives me enough water to get through cooking or whatever through an evening and into the next day. But I tend not to like to work out of my emergency water unless I am in an actual emergency. And I'll define that as basically going through all of the water that I thought I was going to need for the day um, and having to tap into that supply to continue my hydration at the same level that I was doing. Uh, it's particularly important during hot months, during hot rides, during long rides. Uh, you know, I don't even, I probably don't have to go through and be your dad on this one about Staying hydrated is so important in this type of an activity. Once you start going below a certain threshold amount in terms of the hydration that you've got, all sorts of bad things start happening inside your system. We're talking cramps. We're talking all sorts of types of things. Not only is it a problem for you physically, but what a bummer, <laughs> you know? It's a bummer because it ends up impacting the joy of your ride. So making sure that you've got plenty of water, including that emergency bottle, that emergency hydration pack, whatever can be the difference between you having an enjoyable day and you having a not enjoyable day and even going even further and getting into some serious problems that you want to avoid. So I always recommend that emergency bottle and um, it's it, you, can, you can make it just a small one um, because again, you know, we don't need to account for tons of water in an emergency. Hopefully this is an outlier. This is something that you'll need to tap into rarely because you know your body and you know your needs and you know what this ride is going to require of you. And so you're going to plan appropriately that way. This is water that is in addition to that. So think about that as well. When you've got a water purification system, it takes a little bit of pressure off of that emergency bottle. But I will say it's probably one of those things that as you're tapping into an emergency bottle, maybe that's the point when you're starting to think, I'd like to find a water source that I'm going to tap into to do the purification. That's a timing issue at that point. You know you've got trusted water from a trusted source, and now you're looking at replenishing the water and upping your supply uh, either completely if you can, because purifying water takes some time, um, or at least getting you to a point where you know you've got enough supply that the emergency supply goes back to being an emergency supply. Um, that would be a good recommendation there, just in terms of utilizing the emergency source, your emergency bottle as a sort of a, a timer for you as to when you should start thinking about purifying water in the middle of a day um, or a middle of a ride. One thing that I would also say as a part of all of this, and this is sort of just closing it all out, and I believe I also talked about this on episode 23, so apologies for the repeat information. Don't refill or use containers that hold untrusted water without filtering. And I'll say that in a different way. What you need to make sure is that any container that touches water that you don't know is good, and that is Everything from that beautiful clear mountain stream that's rushing by, frankly, if it's moving water, the odds are lower that it's going to contain bugs in it that's going to be problematic. It is not fail-safe, though. Um, 
you know, whether it's that kind of water supply or it's that skanky algified pond that's your, the only thing that's around. Um, once a water container touches something like that, until you can absolutely and fully be sure that you're going to be, um, oh, what's the word? Cle- not just cleaning it, but, but, uh, um, uh, sanitizing it making sure that it's sanitized, you should treat that container as essentially being undrinkable regardless, even when it completely dries out. Because things like crypto will go into a spore-like state when it is completely dried out and will re-hyper, or will, will come back basically once it hits water again. And those spores, if they get inside of you, that spore state, it's not a true spore, um, it will be just as bad because it will repopulate and you are screwed because crypto is really, 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 really bad. Um, I'm old enough to remember and some of you in the Midwest may remember, uh, it got, cryptosporidium got into the Milwaukee, Wisconsin drinking water and killed a whole Whole bunch of people. I feel like it was a couple dozen people, um, and it, because it was in their municipal water system, and it created a whole hullabaloo in the states, and especially in the Milwaukee area, uh, because uh, we weren't sure about the safety of our water supply for a little bit in there. So, crypto is something to be really, really, really aware of, and because of that, because of other things, Giardia and some other things as well, can survive a while in a bad bottle. Um, you don't want to trust a bottle that has touched unknown, untrusted water until it can be resanitized. So what often people will do is they'll use oh, maybe a, a col- not, not a collapsible. Well, it could be a collapsible. It's whatever you end up using. But people will tend to use a recyclable plastic bottle, maybe an old smart water bottle. I know hikers love using that. A lot of folks who bike tour like using those smart water bottles because they fit. Um, the tops fit really nicely. Um, and they've got a nice light plastic. It's strong but light. People will use that as their uh, untrusted water uh, supply. So they'll fill that in the untrusted water, screw that into their Sawyer squeeze if that's what they're using. And then that's always going to be the bad water bottle. And they can, they, they carry that around. You mark it, make sure you've got some way to show because it, the worst thing you can do is to have a couple of those, say, let's say you're using those smart water bottles as your water bottles. The worst thing in the world is to be, wait a second, which one's the dirty one and which one's the clean one? You want to make sure you know which one's which. So mark it if you can. Figure out some way to make sure that you know which one is the good one and which one is the bad one. So I'm curious what all of you are doing for your water purification. The answer to that for you may be, Tim, I haven't even thought about it. I haven't had to deal with it. I go cycling on paved trails that are rails to trails and there's a water uh, you know, station every five miles and that's great. But if you're ever thinking of breaking out of that, this is something you'll want to think about because making sure you are hydrated is uh, probably up there in the top one or two types of things to deal with in terms of uh, bicycle touring. I mean, we're talking your shelter, we're talking water. I think it's 1A and 1B right there for a safety reasons. So purifying water, having a system, having an idea, thinking about it at the very least, even if it's just using that emergency bottle and carrying extra water from trusted sources, you got to have a strategy and it's something that you got to be thinking about before you go out on any tour. And we'd like to close out the show with a big thank you to all of the monthly supporters of the Pedal Shift Project. If you like what you hear, you can help maintain Pedal Shift as an independent, listener-supported voice while expanding the offerings. Five bucks, two bucks, even a buck a month. That helps with the cost of hosting the podcast and the website. You can do it for a bit. Cancel any time. We've got one-shot support. Choose your own adventure support. If you don't like the small monthly thing, hey, we thank them here too. Check it out, pedalshift.net slash society. On to the society. Ethan Georgie, Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lane, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Josiah Matthews, Keith Nagel, Brock Dittis, Thomas Skadow, Seth Krieger, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Noah Schroer, Harry Telgatis, John Sikorsky, Richard Killian, Chris Barron, Scott Taylor, Brian Wren, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Paul Mulvey, Stuart Buchan, Todd Stutz, Mr. T, Roxy Arning, Nathan Poulton, Harry Hugel, Ferguson Meek, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Ruth DeVorsey, Michelle Miller, Matthew Lewis, Michael Baker, Billy Crafton, Paul Culbertson, Scott Culbertson, Matt Perry, and new to the Pedal Shift Society, Danielle Jepson, and thank you all also to Anonymous and past contributors for making the show happen. 
Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net. Lots of great content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through iTunes or your favorite podcast aggregator. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his debut album. Track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Habitat, wherever cool music is available.